Great. Good evening. Lovely to see you. I've met some visitors or some very old attendees of Hillcrest Baptist. It's lovely to have you with us. Those people who are online, special welcome to you as well. And we trust that the Lord would bless us tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. It is a special time for us to look back on the history of this land, to see how you have moved and the great things that you have done for us. Also to reflect on the things that man has done and how often we sin and we fall short of your glory. I want to pray, especially, Heavenly Father, as we want to look at the history of our land from a godly perspective. It often causes us to change our views and our attitudes, and I pray that you would enable us by your Spirit to do that with grace. At the end of the day, we want to look at our land from your perspective. We want to honor you even as we go forward, and we pray that you would bless us to this end. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, well done. You've signed up for five weeks of history. Well done. I can only say congratulations, and we trust that the numbers won't dwindle too much as they often do during a seminary cafe. just want to make one um, just mention about the notes. So for those of you who ask for printed notes, you will see you've got three slides per page with some place for note-taking on the right-hand side. If that doesn't work for you, please let me know. But when I looked at it, it looked like the slides were large enough to read and give you some space to make some notes. But you can let me know if not. Okay, so we've got quite a bit to get through tonight, and so let's get going. So if we just take a step back, we, as South Africans, we often complain a lot about our country, but if we actually take a step back and just look at what we have in South Africa at the moment, we are in a Baptist church in Durban. We are surrounded by multiple churches of almost every denomination. Um, you can think of. You can go into a Christian bookshop and you can get Bibles freely in Afrikaans, Zulu, Sesotho, all different types of languages. I know some of our um, people in the church who are involved in missions work, they look for um, Bibles in all different other languages and they are available in our land. We've got Christian bookshops where you can go and buy books of almost every variety and sort, some not to be recommended, others to be recommended. We've even in this land got a South African Council of Churches. So when you actually just step back, there is much to rejoice in in terms of we have got a rich Christian background and heritage, which many other countries in the world do not have, and there are countries in the world where people have not even heard of the name of Jesus. And so we have to stand here in 2022 and look back and say that God has moved in South Africa. Not many nations have got, in fact, what we have got, and God has visited this land, and he has moved in this land. So, why study South African church history? As I said, history is often not a very popular subject. I find it fascinating um, and interesting. It tells us what God has done in our land. And whenever we look at the works of God, it should excite believers to see what is done. Many people, when they study history, they say, you must know where you have come from. If we want to know where we're going. Certainly, history provides a context for us to understand where we are in South Africa. 
And one of the main reasons for studying history is meant to be so we don't make the same mistakes again. I think what we do learn from history is that everybody makes the same mistakes again and that we never learn from history. But by God's grace, we can um, learn from history. More importantly, however, in South Africa in particular, our understanding of history has definitely been distorted by political and ideological influences. Certainly I have, and my perspectives have completely changed since I've become a Christian. And so we need to be recalibrated by Christ's perspective when we reflect on our history. Our history has been rewritten a few times, and we want to, um, we want to have Christ's perspective. So I just want to focus on the last little bit of that slide. I may say some things that you don't like. Okay, so I am unfortunately going to do that. If you are Afrikaans here tonight or listening, you are not going to necessarily like some of the things that I'm going to say. If you're English, you're not necessarily going to like some of the things that I'm going to say that have happened in South Africa. If you're American, you're safe. <laughs> but the rest of us, we're in for a bit of a, a rough time. My understanding of looking at our history from a godly perspective to assess and judge the things that have happened, we need to be prepared to look at our own culture and our own people group, and what the Bible has to say about that. I've got the problem that my mother is English and my father is Afrikaans, so I'm in the middle of it all the time, but we need to do that. Okay, just some expectations that we need to manage as we come to this five-week seminary cafe. Um, Obviously, in five weeks, we cannot um, deal with everything in South African church history. It is essentially an overview and focusing on particular areas of church history. So certainly a lot that has been left out, and we can't touch on it all. Second thing about managing expectations is um, it's not going to be a course about when somebody came to the Cape and when they did this, we're wanting to learn lessons, we're wanting to interpret, and we are wanting to understand our history. So I'm trying to focus on insights, um, looking at, at opportunities for us, especially going, at, going into the future. Then the third expectation, which is an important one, I am not an expert on church history. Uh, my PhD was in um, other matters, so, but I do have a Bachelor of Theology where I did the full range of history, early church history, Old Testament history, um, and obviously Southern Africa history, world history, and South African history. In my master's and PhD, I focused quite a lot more on the history of Baptists in South Africa, so I'm a lot more... Um, proficient and understanding in some of that. Um, and then on some of the other Baptist groups that we are going to focus on, Solar Five, um, Independent Baptist Fellowship in South Africa, I've done some research around those. Um, so there might even be people here or online who are much more knowledgeable in particular areas of South African church history. If I've made some small mistake somewhere or I've read some of the wrong sources. You're welcome to correct me. But I trust, because we are just dealing with an overview, um, I've got most of it right. The format for each session. So we are going to each evening start tea, coffee, and donuts at um, 7 o'clock, 1900. And we're going to start promptly then at 1930 because we love streaming this. Um, 60 to 80 minutes. I'm not planning to be more than an hour each evening, but it might go over. 
um, of presentation and they certainly can ask questions. So during our session, just do raise your hand and um, ask a question. I will repeat it for those people online that they can hear what the question is. Um, so there is opportunity for questions, but it is more lecture type uh, seminary cafe this evening. Um, I've just checked with Mindy, we don't need help clearing the hall. All we need to do is our used plates and mugs just need and cups just need to be put in the rubbish bins next to the table um, as you leave. Thanks for that. The sources that I've used, um, if any of you do enjoy history, three books that I can recommend. The Story of the Church in um, South Africa by Kevin Roy. It's quite a new book. That one there. Quite a good read, easy read. Nice overview as well. And then I've used some other um, sources, and you can see those in the notes. Structure of the sessions. So where are we going in the next five weeks? Session one is really just a strategic overview of church, but also the, the politics of South Africa. What happened in the political sphere and how those two interacted. Pretty broad brush. Um, so tonight we're going to touch on quite a lot of things from 1652 up to when we became a democratic country. Just some of the big movements in church history and in the politics. And that's going to form a background or a context for the remaining four sessions. Um, next week we are going to look at how the denominations developed from early South Africa so we can understand basically how we got to what we've got at the moment. Session three is going to be just on the most important denomination in South Africa, the Baptists. Um, how did, what is happening in the Baptist Union, Solar Five, um, where did the Afrikaans Baptists come from and the German Baptists? We've got representatives of all of those in uh, this church, which is lovely. Session four, quite an important one, the African Independent Churches. Who are they? How did they develop? And Pentecostalism, how that came into South Africa and how it influenced the churches. And then session five, we're looking at revival, the, the wonderful way that God moved in South Africa in revival. Um, a lot of people don't know that, but it's a wonderful part of our history. And then we're going to wrap it up with looking at some of those big lessons that we have to learn as we look at our past so that when we go into the future, we don't make the same mistakes. There are bad mistakes that were made, and it helps us to understand our role and the context in which we operate in South Africa. Okay, so those are the five sessions. So the format of the slides uh, looks like that. So that is basically a lot of the slides that you are going to see on the right-hand side, then, I'm going to put the information and always link it back to the left-hand side. So when the, the box with text in is in blue, we're looking at the Dutch period from 1652 to 1800. Then we've got a British period where the British um, ruled in the Cape, 1800 to 1910. Then from 1910 to... 1960 is the Union of South Africa, still under British oversight. Then 1960 is when South Africa left um, Britain and the oversight of Britain and became a republic. And then 1994, when we had democratic elections to date. So watch the color scheme. That's going to tell you where the events happened. But I do have dates next to that text. Okay, homework. I'm so sorry to introduce homework so early on, but it's not stringent at all. What I would love for us to do is in our last session, session five, for you to help me. I'm going to leave that session a little bit more flexible, that as you reflect over these four weeks, that in the fifth week, you are able to then introduce some of the key lessons that you have learned, some insights, um, reflections that maybe I haven't brought forward and I would love to consolidate those for the next seminary cafe that I run 
on South African church history. I believe we can learn a lot from each other. Maybe some things you'd like to correct that um, you feel I didn't quite have the right insight um, and we can discuss a little bit. So there will be some flexibility in the last session. So please do, as we're going through this each week, and you say, hey, I don't agree with that, or there's another insight that you might have missed, please just jot it down. You're welcome to email it to me during these weeks, um, but then we'll be able to have a little bit more interaction in session five. Okay, so session one, let's go. Early South African church history, the the, his, the, the church history and the political history, just a broad brush overview. It is mainly going to be big events, as I mentioned, um, giving us a context for the next sessions. And I do want to mention here just the issue of sensitivity. I'm sorry I don't know how to deal with this adequately so that I don't offend everybody. Um, being politically sensitive to racial groups and titles so we do have to use terminology. So um, I'm afraid the only thing that I could resolve, I can't call um, people African because I had some white people who came up to me and say, look, I'm African, I'm born in Africa, I've had so many generations, I'm African. So I'm afraid in line with some of the legislation which we still had, I am going to refer to black people, Indian people, white people and colored people as we look back on our history so that you can understand what I am talking about. I hope I don't offend anybody with that. I know I'm not white, I'm pink. And I know, and I know you're not black, you're brown. And God has made us a rainbow nation, but so I'm just going to use those titles. And there's, um, sincerely, there's no offense to anyone. And if somebody has got better um, way for me to refer to our history, but at times we've got to be specific as to who we are talking about. So I'm going to use that terminology. Um, okay, uh, hot and tot is another one. So I believe that's an offended, the, the koi koi, we're called the hot and tot. Uh, some people are offended by that. So I'm gonna try and keep to koi koi. So I'll, I'm gonna try and be um, as politically sensitive as I can. Okay, a history of God's grace to this precious land of ours. Let's jump in. So I'm starting this seminary cafe, 1652, where 90 employees of the Dutch East Indian Company landed in, their ca in the Cape. Why did they come here? They had a commercial interest, and that was to be a refreshment or supply station for the ship's coming round um, Africa, going to the east to do trade. So it was a commercial interest of the Dutch and 90 of them landed here, refreshment station um, for ships passing. People got scurvy because um, they didn't get vitamin C and so they needed these places to get fresh fruit and veggies, meat uh, to supply their ships. So these employees were from Obviously, Holland, they were Dutch. They were from the Dutch Reformed Church. Now, the Dutch Reformed Church, uh, still today, holds to the Heidelberg Catechism. There's a Belgic Confession. They're the Canons of Dort. All of these are Reformed Confessions of Faith, which we would largely hold to. That is wonderful. It could have been... Islam that landed in the Cape. It wasn't. It was Christianity and it was of a reformed persuasion which we believe is quite sound. <coughs> however, and this is a big however, many of those Dutch reformed people were what I would have to call nominal Christians. Because when some of the missionaries or some of the, the people that I would call born-again believers came to South Africa, they had a look at the white Dutch people 
and they saw abuse of slaves, they saw a disregard for the Khoikhoi people, they saw drunkenness, uh, which was not great. So I just want to reflect on that just a little bit. So imagine that your business sends you to a new land where there are indigenous people. Maybe you're, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe you're in agriculture or something like that. You have got the opportunity to show those people Christ. Even though you're going there for your business, here is an indigenous population that hasn't even heard of the name of Jesus. And you go there as a Christian and you start with drunkenness, abusing the local population because you've got a superior military might. How sad is that? Lesson for us. We carry the name of Christ wherever we go, and South Africa may have been a totally different place if these early 90 people were had a sincere profession of who they were. They certainly did attend the Dutch Reformed Church. They would have attended church services, as we're going to see. But when missionaries came and they looked at how many of these people were behaving, it was very disappointing. Okay, so that's my first strike at, in, at what happened in South Africa. Not great. But I want to just also reflect on this. Isn't this amazing that God works through commercial companies? This was a Dutch East Indian company wanting to make its trade more successful. They, their primary motivation was not religious. It was business. And God used it to bring the gospel to South Africa, to this land. So we just see how God uses all the things that we hap happening in the world today. Microsoft, Amazon, all the different stuff. God is working in and through them to establish his purposes. And how wonderful it was for South Africa that we got a gospel influence. Okay, that is what I wanted to say on that slide. And so that is where everything really started in 1652 on the southern tip of South Africa. Okay, so Jan van Riebeek, he was the commander of the Cape, as you're almost all aware. And the way they were structured at that time was that the governor, the political governor, also had a, he was also responsible for the religious, um, the religion of the land. Okay, he was both. That is their particular view of um, church and state. And they were pretty strict in terms of their societal rules. I mean, some of you might be a bit unhappy with the elders at HBC telling you you should be attending church. But we don't do this. Miss church for the first time, forego six days wine rations. Miss church for the second time, you forego one month's salary. That's pretty harsh, eh? Miss church the third time you work for one year in chains with no payment. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty tough. Um, okay, that's how South Africa, how it started and how that's what Jan van Riebeek did. Okay, now something important happened because the Khoi Khoi or the Hottentots as they were called at that time because of the cliques in all their language, um, they could not provide enough meat for the Dutch East Indian Company and enough produce. Um, something happened that they didn't want to happen. The Dutch East Indian Company had a policy that they did not want to own land. They simply wanted to trade with the local farmers, get in the produce, produce and give it to the ships. And they couldn't do that. There wasn't enough. And so they started giving land to the Dutch. And now you just know problems are going to arise. Firstly, 
is it your land to give? I mean, you just rocked up with guns. So is it your land to give? Which land do you give to your people? Are you going to give them the worst land? No, you're going to give them the best land. So what is it going to do? It is going to cause conflict with the local people. And that is exactly what happened. But it was not the original intent, but they decided to do that because they had to for economic reasons. Okay. Now, during this time, as these um, first of the Dutch East Indian employees um, arrived, there was no ordained minister for these people. Um, there was a layman, Willem Weiland. Um, he was really what they actually called a sick comforter. Um, he would attend to the sick, and he ministered in the churches. He was not allowed to preach his own sermons because they said you're not qualified, so they had to send sermons from overseas, and he had to read them out in the church. Okay, that's what was his job. But when I did some reading about him, I found out he actually, I think, needs to be called the first pioneer missionary in South Africa because he actually had a love for the local people and a concern for their souls which generally the Dutch East Indian Company did not have. So I think this dude, as a layman, had a heart for Christ and for the people, and that was absolutely wonderful. 1658, you can see it's just broad issues, um, big events that happen in South Africa. That's all we've got time for tonight. 1658, slaves were imported from Asia to the Cape by the white landowners and the Dutch... Um, as a nation, were slaveholders at the time. Um, the Dutch Reformed Church then did get a, an ordained minister in 1665, uh, Johan van Arkel, he, he came along. And for the next 150 years, because the Dutch government was in place, they only allowed the Dutch Reformed Church to operate. They didn't allow any other church services uh, to take place in the Cape. Okay, let's move on. So, probably everybody's heard about the French Huguenots. Uh, between 1688 and 1700, 150 French Huguenots arrived. So, what happened in France was, um, because of the political changes there with the Roman Catholics versus the Protestants, um, the Protestants were heavily persecuted, and 150 of those Huguenots came out uh, to South Africa. They were Calvinistic, and so they got assimilated into the Dutch Reformed Church because essentially they held to the same uh, Reformed uh, foundations. Very importantly, however, the Dutch came to the Cape because they were commercially driven, right? Why did the Huguenots come to the Cape because they were genuine Christians persecuted for their faith and wanted to go to another country to be able to live their faith before God. So they, I believe, were a great spiritual input into the Dutch Reformed Church um, and I believe gave some spiritual impetus um, into the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa. And so these settlers spread to Stellenbosch, Franschhoek, and if you go there today, Tilbach, uh, Malmesbury, you'll see some of the French flair in the buildings and the architecture. And of course, they brought winemaking with them. Praise God. Many people would say that, wouldn't they? Just people love wine, and uh, so they brought with them as well um, wine making. 1713, great tragedy for the local people. One of the visiting ships brought smallpox to South Africa. You can understand the local population, the Khoi Khoi, never had smallpox, no uh, resistance to it, and it decimated them. Over a third 
of the Khoi Khoi population were killed off um, because of the smallpox. And so as we think about lessons and as we send missionaries to foreign lands, there's never going to be, take the spiritual side away, there's never going to be no impact. There is going to be some impact. This was an unfortunate negative impact. Um, not that uh, the ships were coming specifically for religious reasons, but it just does teach us when you go to a new country with different people as missionaries are, you've got to think about the impact that you are going to have on the people that you're going to see. But just another big lesson for us. So isn't it amazing that in France, God used that political turmoil with the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestantism, and he used the persecution to send 150 sincere, devout believers to the Cape. And I believe that must have had a spiritual impact on us. And so on the other side of the world, the persecution that happened there had a positive impact in this country. And God working through these big events around the world um, to bless this country. Okay, and so what we see is those um, Huguenots went out um, into the interior to those places that I mentioned, Stellenbosch, Franschhoek, and so started to spread. Let's go. There was this one guy, Helperus Brahm. Help me, is that how you help? Helperus. Yes, him. Um, <laughs> he, let me just get my, sorry, I think I put my notes. He was called the Jonathan Edwards of the Cape. Apparently this guy had just a great spiritual heart for the lost, for the cause of Christ. Intellectually, he was um, really quite a very sharp guy. And um, as I did a little bit of reading about him, they really called him the Jonathan Edwards of the Cape. So we've had a Jonathan Edwards in South Africa, great zeal and intellect. He cared for the spiritual condition of slaves and koi koi, which not many had. And he awakened quite a, quite a concern amongst the churches for the local people and their salvation, which is wonderful. So as we come to the end of the Dutch period, there were about 26,000 white people, 29,000 slaves, and about 18,000 koi koi. And out of the interaction between the Dutch, the slaves, and the koi koi, emerged two new phenomena in South Africa. The Afrikaans language, which, you know, but it didn't start off like that. And in fact, Afrikaans was originally considered I don't know how to put it politically correctly, but I suppose kitchen Dutch. It was just, uh, it was more a commoner's language, and Dutch was used for the um, the courts and those types of things. So, that was like Afrikaans um, as it started out. It certainly changed. And the colored people, they emerged from this interaction. Okay. The Roy Necker, the British period. So, in 1792, events on the other side of the world would have a massive impact on South Africa. Britain was at war with France. Holland fell to France. So, in 1795, Britain occupied the Cape to prevent it falling into French hands. The Napoleon came into power just a few years after that, and then you had the uh, Napoleonic Wars in Europe. British soldiers arrived, and what was there? And so those were the English, the Scottish, and the Irish. 
So who were they? Anglicans, Methodists, Presbyterians, Roman Catholics, Congregationals, and Baptists. All of the origins of these denominations came from the British occupation of the Cape. Okay, once again, we see how God uses war on the other side of the world to influence a country on the southern tip of Africa. I mean, isn't that amazing? And so that's why we've got a Baptist church here today, because of the war in Europe. And that's how God works in the big political movements um, around the world. The 1820 settlers arrived in 1820. Well, what happened there was um, there was unemployment in Britain, and uh, the people in the Cape weren't so nice, eh? They, they got people here under false pretenses. What the people in the, what the Dutch in the Cape, well, the, the people in the Cape now, a lot of them Dutch, etc. but what the people in the Cape wanted was on the eastern border, they wanted to have a, a, a buffer between the settlers and some of the African tribes. That's what they wanted to do. So what they said to the people in Britain, come over to South Africa, we've got farming land for you. So the farmland wasn't that great. It wasn't good for agriculture in the Eastern Cape. And um, you had the Koza people just on the other side, and there was conflict. And so they wanted these poor 1820 settlers to be human shields <laughs> for the Cape. And so... They weren't so happy. Many of the settlers were disillusioned. Um, it was dangerous, and there was poor agricultural land. But they were in South Africa, and that was it. And then 1824, closer to home, that was when um, a small group of uh, the British came to establish the port and to manage the port of Durban. Okay, and so we find spreading out. Um, especially with the 1820 settlers into the eastern frontier of South Africa. Okay. Are you still tracking? Okay, good. So it is a, you've got the notes. Um, 1834, slavery was abolished uh, in the British Cape Colony, which is obviously significant. You can see there was a substantial slave population. Big event for South Africa in this British period was in 1838, the Groot Trek. So what happened was that the Dutch or the Afrikaners, as they were now called, um, in the Cape were dissatisfied with British rule. Um, and so they wanted to move north and east. And they did that. They formed a republic in Natal around Peter Maritzburg, called Natalia. That did not last long, only a few years, and then the British took that over. So the two republics that remained were republics of Transvaal and the Orange Free State. Those were the two then um, Boer or Afrikaans republic, uh, republics that, that endured. They had no Dutch Reformed ministers with them, because the Dutch Reformed Church in the Cape did not approve of the Great Trek. They said, you, how, how can you go and move to the north? You're not going to have churches. You're not going to have spiritual oversight. And they said, don't go. But um, the Boers went ahead, and so they couldn't get um, Dutch Reformed ministers. During that period, you had the Battle of Blood River, uh, which I'm going to refer to in a few slides' time, very important for the Afrikaner nation um, as to how they viewed themselves and the significance of that Battle of Blood River. In 1857, something very important happened. About 2,400 German sh soldiers were permitted to settle in the Eastern Cape, and they were followed by German settlers. Why was that important for us? Many of those were Baptists. And we're going to look in the third session how these German Baptists and the English Baptists came together to form the Baptist Union of South Africa. 
Um, why were the Germans allowed into South Africa? They fought for the British in the Crimean War. Um, you can see the dates there. Um, and the Crimean War was essentially between Russia and an alliance of France and the UK and the Ottoman Empire, etc. Uh, and so the German Baptists came into South Africa from yet another war. In 1860 to 1866, 6,000 Indians were brought in to be slave labor in Natal under some harsh conditions. But those Indians did remarkably well. So when we look today, we see that they were fairly industrious people. They've certainly, um, in the Durban municipality, there are a massive amount of Indians in um, highly skilled um, positions. And so they really did well for themselves coming from such humble beginnings. And they brought us curry. <laughs> so that was a... Um, silver lining to a fairly dark cloud. Okay, and so we find then um, people moving out, the, the great trek into the Transvaal, Orange Free State, um, into Natal. Okay, still in the British period, we're moving through, checking the time quite well. We should be going fine. I must just say that for this first session, I wasn't quite sure of how much material to put in. I'll be able to judge the next sessions a little bit well, but we seem to be going fine. Okay, in 1877, the British got a hiding. What they tried to do was they wanted to forcefully annex the Transvaal, and we had the first Anglo-Boer War, and the British were defeated. Do you know how humbling that was for the British? They were one of the great industrial nations of the world, <laughs> and they went to go and try and subdue and annex this little province of Afrikaans people, and they lost. Okay, so in 1881, the British recognized the independence of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. However, 1886, gold. So gold, one of the richest gold deposits in the world, discovered uh, in the Transvaal, and of course the British can't, you know, we can't leave it like that. They wanted to control the gold. And that led to the second Anglo-Boer War, 1899 to 1902. A significant event for us to understand how things played out in South Africa. Uh, it was a bitter conflict um, the, after the British made some incisive inroads, um, a lot of the Boers resorted to guerrilla warfare, and the British just couldn't um, win the battle, so they adopted their scorched earth policy, where they put women and children into concentration camps, and they burnt the farms to... Um, to finally stop uh, the war, and so they were victorious. That, these three years, caused massive bitterness and resentment um, of the Afrikaans people towards the white people. Um, a massive, massive impact on the Afrikaans nation. So I just want to say a few things about that. So when I was in Freiburg, I was um, in primary school, and uh, it was predominantly an Afrikaans, it was a big Afrikaans settlement, and there were a few English families, and I went to um, Freiburg Laar School, which was an Afrikaans school, but there were two English medium classes. So... I never understood it at the time, but I always wondered why my brother and I got bullied. I mean, we used to cycle to school, and especially this one house, we dreaded cycling past this one house, but there was nothing we could do. When we, as we cycled past this big teenage 
Afrikaans cow always used to come running out, wanted to slap us around, bullied us. Why is he doing that? We were just cycling to school. And as I reflected and understood, um, it was the deep resentment of the Afrikaans people. And here are these two little Roy Nickies coming along on their bicycles. And um, so, yeah, th a deep bitterness and resentment um, towards the British and the English because of what happened in the Anglo-Boer War. And we cannot underestimate um, some of that is still around today in some of the Afrikaans culture. Um, and so we need to just reflect a little bit um, on this. I told you it was going to be a bit unpopular. So here is the unpopularity towards the English. So this is the mom's side of my heritage. So England or Britain profess to be a Christian nation, right? They profess to be a Christian nation. So when the gold came along, they already allowed the Transvaal to be an independent um, republic. They wanted to control the money. Uh, at this time, I've done some reading about it, they actually said, look, we're going to war against the Transvaal because some of the people weren't given the vote. So that's not the real reason, is it? They wanted to control the money. To resort to, as a, as a professing Christian nation, to resort to taking women and children, putting them in concentration camps where over a third of them perished from disease and malnutrition, burning farms, etc. Not quite Christian, is it? Not a just war, is it, to control wealth. And so the British... The colonial British movement of that time will have a lot to answer to the Lord as a professing Christian nation and the things they did in war. Um, and I think we are aware of it. So, um, that's all I wanted to say on that slide. Priest Treaty 1902, very important. So Britain won the war, and they just wanted to have peace with um, the Afrikaans people, and something significant happened. In that peace treaty, they delayed the decision about the black vote because it was contentious with the Afrikaans people. So in order just to get the peace treaty signed, they said, look, we won't deal with the, with the issue of the black vote at that stage. So they went into then post-1902 with the indigenous black people not being allowed to vote in the country. An absolutely significant decision that impacted the rest of our history. Okay. So... 1910, the British then ruled and they consolidated South Africa, the four colonies, which essentially were the four, uh, the four provinces into the Union of South Africa. Um, you can read a little bit about um, that in the notes, what that meant. So General Louis Boerta, he headed the first government of this new union with General Jan Smuts as his deputy. Um, their South African National Party, later known as the South African Party or SAP, they were actually, in terms of the Afrikaans people, generally pro-British, but white unity um, people. And there were some more radical Boers who split away from the leadership of, uh, uh, under the leadership of Gen General Barry Hatzog, forming the National Party. Okay, so there's a bit of a split as to how the Afrikaans nation now, um, with re regard to how they viewed the British, and that was going to have serious impact a little bit later. And so that then established the four provinces um, from yesteryear in South Africa. Okay, so at the end of the British period, next week we're going to go into how this happened, but in fact... 
there were quite a few missionary organizations um, in South Africa at the time and societies. And in 1904, they established the General Missionary Conference to unite and consolidate uh, evangel uh, evangelism and missions in South Africa. And that was the seed for what we're going to see in a few slides time for what eventually became the South African Council of Churches. And we'll go into that more next week. Um, okay, in 1914, there was a small rebellion by some of the Boers, what they were called the Bitter Einders, um, but that was quickly subdued. So I want to just reflect on what happened next. Very significant in terms of South Africa. So at, after the Second, the, the second Anglo-Boer War, the Afrikaans nation obviously was defeated and there was a strong movement to restore the dignity of the nation. And some of the Enchia, what we would just broadly call now the Enchia Kerk, the theologians and the Duomenes, drew parallels between the Afrikaans nation and Israel. And they basically said this, Die Groot 1638, was equivalent to the Exodus. The Afrikaans nation was equivalent to the new Israel, the promised nation, and that happened through the covenant that they made with God at the Battle of Blood River. Very strong associations in the Enchiakarik theology at that time with the deliberate intent to build up the Afrikaans nation, their pride and their identity. And it was very successful, but theologically compromised. Theologically compromised. So, I've, I've given the British a bit of a thrashing, and now we must just turn um, to what happened to the Afrikaner nation and this particular incident. So this was scripture twisting at its worst. If you just think about it, what these Enchia Kerk Duomenes were doing, they were trying to use the Bible to bolster up a nation. So the Afrikaans nation is not a new Israel or a new promise, a uh, people of promise before God. Theologically, they are not. Whatever happened at the Battle of Blood River and the covenant and oath that they make did not make them into a new promised nation. And the trek was not the exodus. And I'm going to deal with this a little bit more strongly um, next week when we look at the denominations and how they developed and we focus on the Dutch Reformed Church. But this was serious theological compromise on behalf of the Afrikaans people. It gave them a false identity. And I believe that a lot of the nominalism that we have in the Afrikaans nation today, and this is my dad's side now, um, I'm split in the middle, my fun is ni okam for nitni. A people group today thinking that they are right with God because they are born Afrikaans. That was the legacy of this. They think they're going to heaven, so over a meal they will pray, and then the next minute they will turn and swear at their African labor like they are dogs. Consequence of this, giving people a false national identity based on scripture twisting that is serious and many of these people will answer to God for how they abused the Bible uh, during this period. Okay, and I will say a little bit more about that next week and maybe in one of the slides I'm just trying to think. Okay, 
We're getting near to 8.25. We've only, in fact, got a few more slides left, and then we'll take some questions. So you hang in there. We're nearly at the end. Okay, so 1924 then, uh, the Afrikaner dominated National Party came into power um, in a coalition government with the Labour Party. Uh, in 1936, on the um, religious side, that general missionary con uh, conference, which I spoke about, um, became, it was turned into the, Cri the Christian Council of South Africa. It represented about 30 different churches and missionary societies, um, representing the, lo the large um, spectrum of the Protestant churches, and they became later the South African Council of Churches. Um, 1941, the Dutch Reformed Church withdrew from the Christian Council of South Africa due to English Afrikaans tensions. So these English Afrikaans tensions now carried on um, and we still have them today in some circles. And then in 1948, extremely significant, the National Party wins uh, the election and we have the subsequent formalization of apartheid. Sorry, I do bash the Burkis a little bit more in this slide. What happened in this period of South Africa? We essentially had a church and a state that worked together. The National Party was essentially in Gierkerk people. A lot of the ministers, some of them were previous Dwemenes, um, but all members in good standing with the Engia Kerk. And what the Engia Kerk did was gave theological justification for the Afrikaans nation being the new people of God. And they also gave theological justification to apartheid and the superior superiority of the Afrikaans nation. So next week... I will deal with a little bit more closely, but just some issues to understand. This was an unholy alliance between church and state. The church was using the Bible and theology to basically prosper a political party. There was serious compromise on the part of the Engia Kerk. They were serving two masters. They were trying to and they ended up serving the wrong one in this particular era. Scripture twisting to serve a political master, the National Party justifying apartheid in the name of Christianity, and that is serious. And I just want to make a few comments um, on that. I understand that it is a little bit of a generalization, but... What happened during this period, um, let me say this. I've come across some white Christians, even just a few years ago, speaking about our old government and saying the good old days when we had a Christian government. And I just looked at this person and I thought, you don't know what you're talking about. Do you understand, you see, we're coming at church history now and at, at South African history from a Christian perspective. What they did was they claimed to be a Christian government, believing in the Bible, and they gave theological justification for apartheid and for racism. And they displayed that to the world as that is what a Christian government looks like. So they are going to have to answer to that to Christ because essentially they dragged his name through the mud. The Bible does not support racism in any form at all. And yet it was used in this manner. So I believe, and it is my personal opinion, that during this period, the Engia Kerk, and the South African government that claim to be Christian are going to have a serious uh, amount to answer for on the Day of Judgment 
because of how they misrepresented the Bible and Christianity to the world and to our nation. It was not the good old days. You speak to some, speak to Nelly and Paulos, our Christian brothers and sisters in Christ, and ask them if they want to go back to those good old days. Not at all. It was a, it was a terrible time in our land, and even worse, because it was using Christian theological justification for it. And when you do that with Christ, you have to answer to him. Okay. So, a little bit more on that next week. I told you it was going to be a little bit controversial. So, remember at this time now, we are still a state with white-only vote. And so in March 1960 then, you, from before that, but you had Sharpeville riots as the Black Consciousness Movement um, started up in South Africa. In October 1960, there's the vote in South Africa to withdraw from the British Commonwealth. And that is when we became the Republic of South Africa. In 1968, the CCSA just reorganized themselves and they became what's today the um, South African Christian Council. Um, in 1969, 1970, very importantly, the World Council of Churches, of which the South African Council of Churches was a member, started financially supporting liberation movements, including the liberation movements in South Africa. And that caused a whole lot of tension in the South African Council of Churches. Because obviously they were Christians, white, essentially white churches, and now the organization that they belonged to supported what was generally called terrorist organizations at those times. And so massive tension and conflict um, in the South African Council of Churches as to what to do about that. So in fact, in 1976, the Baptist Union withdrew from the South African Council of Churches due to its affiliation with the World Council of Churches. 1978, Desmond Tutu was elected the General Secretary of the South African Council of Churches, the first black General Secretary of the SACC. And then in 1994, we had the democratic elections with new provinces and the ANC as the ruling party. Up to that period, the ANC was unbanned and then negotiations took place for the new South Africa with its provinces. Okay, our last slide for tonight. Some lessons as we now just think back and draw to a close. You've done very well. We've been going for an hour, um, and most of you are still awake. Um, okay, first lesson that we have to just think about as Hillcrest Baptist is that God did not forget Africa, and he did not forget South Africa. The gospel came to the southern tip of Africa, and we, in fact, have a rich Christian heritage, even with Reformed roots, which we would understand to be sound doctrine. It came through commerce and through war on the, from the other side of the world. And we just see a sovereign God working in nations and wars, moving things, pawns, bishops, knights, and he brought the gospel to South Africa. He brought the denominations to South Africa so that today we have got Bibles um, and a rich Christian heritage. Our Lord is sovereign and he works amongst the events of the world, all of them, and he orchestrates things according to his plans. And then just the last lesson for tonight. We are a land of deep hurt, hatred, and division. And that has formed our past and has been part of our past. Um, English Afrikaans, um, resentment from the Anglo-Boer Wars, African or, or black, white colonial Afrikaans, hurt divisions, Battle of Blood River, apartheid, racism, and then what I didn't touch on tonight was also African on African um, tribalism. Uh, I didn't cover any of that, but also tensions in our land. 
So here we are in South Africa, post-1994. Um, this is what has shaped us and our culture groups um, going up to 1994. But I must say this, when I reflect on HBC, I just am so grateful. Remember when um, Henny um, Foster and the Afrikaans Church, how easily English and Afrikaans just harmony. Isn't that what the gospel is for? It is that we are new creatures in Christ. We now have a new master, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have to forgive, and we have to um, embrace our new spiritual family, which must be more important than our cultural backgrounds. We are, have got new identities, and isn't that wonderful? In our congregation, we've got um, African black people, and we work together for the gospel. Christ has, in this little congregation, um, I believe, just given us a small little picture of how spiritual unity works and how it can heal um, the past divisions um, in our land. Okay, so we've got a few um, minutes. If you've got any um, questions, comments, you can email me as well. Anything, any, anything burning that you want to raise, <coughs> that you're not happy with me. Okay, I'm just going to say, it only gets worse in the next session, so <laughs> no, I'm teasing. <laughs> um, yes. 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 Okay, so Mark's comment was essentially just about when the Union of South Africa came together, how the issue of the black vote was just left off the table. It was a difficult issue, um, certainly my understanding, and a lot of the Christian commentators was that the Afrikaans nation didn't want um, uh, an African vote, um, and the British, in order to end the war, um, but the British also had their issues there. It wasn't just an Afrikaans. It wasn't just an Afrikaans thing. The British were quite happy with some of those things, and so they simply left the the question of the black vote unanswered. Well, they did answer it, didn't they? Because the the, the African people didn't have the vote, so they did leave an answer. No, we're not giving you the vote. Um, and that was a massive the pragmatism of war. And peace treaties, that is often not principled simply to get the peace treaty signed. Anything else? Okay, great. Let me close in prayer. Thank you so much for your attention. Please just remember to leave your cups and plates in the rubbish bins at the back as you leave. Heavenly Father, what a history we have. All controlled by your sovereign hand. You have shaped this land. And yet we can see how we as people have sinned in the process, how the whole church in South Africa in many ways compromised. At times in our history, we were not faithful 
to you and to your word. And for that we do ask for forgiveness. But we thank you for your hand of grace and mercy, especially now as we see many of the divisions being healed by your grace, by your word in churches as we become more multiracial. We thank you for that spiritual healing which we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we close tonight, I would pray for the church in South Africa. May we show our nation, may we show the rest of the world, Lord Jesus, how you can bring restoration and healing amongst people who were previously enemies. We see it in the New Testament with Greeks and barbarians being reconciled in the church and we see it in our land and we praise you for your spirit who has done this work in the hearts of your people. Thank you for this time together. We pray that you would part us with your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.